not a professional at this anymore. There we go. Recording to the cloud. I do not have a storage that can hold our recordings. So there you go. Okay. <clears throat> now it's real. All right, here we go. Rabbi Daniel Bogard. See, I did it right. We did it. There I cheated. Well done. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Welcome to the show. And thank you for answering a random email from some from some dude in Virginia. Um, I'm aware the internet is a dangerous place. So thanks for um happy to be here. Thanks for trusting me. Here. Yeah, no, I checked out his show. I liked uh, I liked the vibe. I liked it. It was yeah. clear. The respect yeah. was there. Yeah. Well, that's good. So I don't know. So I think you said you jumped into the middle of a show just at random, yeah, right? Yeah, just like a random middle of the show. Yeah. So I ask an existential question usually at the beginning of the episodes and I, I end with on, one. I mean, I end. Yeah. Hey, it's fine because I feel like this first one you're going to know. And the second one you'll also know, it's just I like to see where people go with them. So okay. when you like try to explain, like, here is what a Rabbi Daniel Bogart is, what is that? I'm a parent of three kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a rabbi. I am a co rabbi with my wife. We've always job shared. Huh. Uh, I feel incredibly called to make this world into the place that I think it always should have been, that our children and our grandchildren deserve. I feel that deeply as a Jewish call. Um, so sometimes I'm an activist because of that. Uh, I'm a musician. Hmm. Uh, I'm a tech geek. I'm a Star Trek fan. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I've used up the big ones. <laughs> um, I always like to make Star Trek um, fans really mad because there's a Jean-Luc Picard meme that has like, it says, use the force, Luke, oh, signed yeah, yeah, Harry yeah, Potter, yeah, just exactly. to make people mad. Yeah, yeah. I like all of them. I like all of them. Um, I'm a big fan of memes. My life is in memes. My, my freaking shirt is a meme um, at, at the moment. I'm not allowed to wear this shirt in public. Um, oh, so it, it says yeah. I tell dad jokes periodically, but it's the periodic table of element. Oh, anyway, yeah. Yeah. wife, lo- my wife bought it and hates it. The kids yeah. love it, yeah, yeah. So, All but yeah, she kids. bought it. She bought it. So what does that mean? I, you want to make this world into something it always should have been. That's, that's a big, like that's, those are some words there. Like what, what does that mean? Yeah. You know, Jewishly, we don't really focus on the afterlife because when we talk, when we talk about the purpose of this world, we don't imagine that this life in this world is some quality control for God to send our souls up or down, you know, figure out which direction they're meant to go. Mm-hmm. There's a real notion that this world is broken because the world isn't done being created yet. Right. It's not that there's been a fall, but it, instead that we were created to do the work of repair. Mm. There's all sorts of mystical language that's used in Judaism uh, around this and uh, beautiful stories. But broadly, that is my understanding of why I am here and why we are here. It's to create the world as it's supposed to be, a world where we treat each other uh, with dignity and we see mm. human beings as human beings and universal health care and you know, all these sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like you and I, I so I, that's actually the kind of Christian that I am. Um, I yeah. get in trouble often because I don't, know that and i say this not tongue-in-cheek like i am not entirely certain that there is a heaven i don't even know that that matters um nor am i certain that there's a hell pretty sure that doesn't matter but i think it's something that you and me create um with our intentional actions and so we like we make things because that's what we're created in like we are we are um uh, what's the word like at Mount Sinai? Like we are the idol of God. Like we are the image of God, and we're yeah, creating yeah, things yeah. because that's what God does. And um, we create heaven and the kingdom of God, or we quite literally break things. And the wages of that is things die and break and fall apart, and it's awful and hellish. I, I, I'm not evangelical well, though. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you know the Jewish scholar Maimonides, also known as Rambam. I know the first name. I don't know know the second name. Just two names from the same uh, Mm -hmm. same person. Mm -hmm. He uh, that's exactly his approach. Really modern. Who lived a thousand years ago? Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. So the reason that I reached out to you, so a thing happened, and I have no idea again exactly when this will air. It will probably be after the kids go back to school. I will probably because I find doing these addictive, like I, ha- I haven't had one of these conversations in a while. Um, 
these are addictive. And so now I'm probably just going to send a bunch of emails and continue to do a bunch of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, it will be, you know, in a few months. And so for those people listening, like it's June 30th today. And this week, there's been a lot of Supreme Court decisions about a lot of things, including today, like the uh, government can't regulate the climate environment, which is fun. Yay, EPA, and let's burn it all down. Um, yeah, so that's fun. So there has been a Roe versus Wade decision. And someone, and I do not know who, pointed me in the direction of you on Twitter, which is always the best way to find things. Um, though I do find some of the best theology currently happening on Twitter. It's if the you best just in the engage, words, yeah. right? Yeah, all at once. Yeah, well, I like because you have to choose your words wisely. Even right. if you do a thread, like you've only got me for two or three. If you do one of eight, like these better be worth it because I'm not making it to eight. I'm, I'm gone. I'm done. Um, yeah, and some so, of my best friends that I've made in terms of relationships and learning have come from Twitter and half the death threats I've ever gotten. Right? <laughs> what? <laughs> half of the death threats. So where did the other half come from? Uh, you know, that's a reality of being a Jewish professional in the 21st century in the United okay. States. Okay. Ah, that's an awful thing. Um, and of the death threats on Twitter, how many of those were bots? Uh, these don't seem, well, I don't know. These are the, the FBI has been involved. Mm, uh, gracious. Because of the seriousness of it. Yeah. Goodness. Goodness. Well, now I feel bad about making a joke about it. No, yeah, whatever. Um, hey, you got to yeah. laugh about it. There's, yeah. you know, Mel Brooks is 96 years old on the day of this recording. So, yeah. Uh, you said yes. Mel Brooks is? Yeah. Mel Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking um, of that, so you had said some things and I have it pulled up. I could read it. I'm probably just going to link to it. Um, and, and we, I may begin by reading some of it. But as I read through it, I realized, well, I thought that I knew things and I thought that I was educated and um, I was not and I was wrong. And so it appears as though the Jewish concept of, of the decision of Roe v. Wade is entirely different because of the Jewish concept of like, like when a human becomes a human is yeah. entirely different. And there's a lot to unpack there. Like that's like seven and a half hours of, of, of unpacking and, and possibly therapy. Um, what is, so I wanted to approach with this. So again, we talked about this on the phone. I pretty much come from ignorance anytime I have a conversation, unless I've specifically read a book and then I read the entire book before we have a conversation. And then I try to ask questions that nobody has. I don't want to ask the questions that come in the inserts because that's who does that. Like that's not, that's not genuine. Yeah. So I was confused because my whole life I've been told everybody that's religious basically believes the same thing that, that I do. and since actually talking to you on the phone, I've dug in further and been like, nope, that's not what Muslims believe. Like that's not what a lot of people believe. And, yeah. and I feel like I've been lied to. And so can you kind of wind back? Like, so you've written a, a few things on, on the internet about, about this decision and about this decision, and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this decision and, and just kind of your faith and how that works in Judaism. And can, where would you begin talking about that with someone? Yeah, you know, I, what I would say is the fundamental distinction that Judaism looks at is between what we consider a life and a potential life. And both of these have enormous value. But a life always takes precedence before anything else. And that's actually a broad Jewish notion that there, there is no commandment that cannot and should not and must not, in fact, be broken for the sake of preserving life. Um, I say that there are, of course, some you know, sorts of exceptions uh, mm. in terms of, yeah. But uh, uh, so Judaism has long viewed life as beginning at breath. We, we go back thousands of years, literally, and we have Jewish commentators who have just understood it normatively uh, to mean that. And, and when you look at the, the Talmud, when you look at folks like Rashi, when you look at sort of the whole breadth and width of the Jewish conversation, that has always been a very settled issue. Uh, so you'll, you'll find disagreement between various Jews and various Jewish streams around the specific boundaries of abortion, uh, yeah. right? In terms of uh, uh, if it's someone's mental health and how severe of their mental health, if it's their future, if it's their life in a more holistic sense, right? Their future in terms of being able to go to college mm -hmm. or uh, if it's their life in the sense of, you know, perhaps they're the parent already of four kids and can't afford another kid. Uh, right, something like 60% of all abortions in the United States, at least uh, uh, while Roe v. Wade stood, were people who already had children. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the boundaries that you find some differences in uh, amongst Jewish movements. But broadly, 
across all of Judaism, there's agreement that there are situations in which is, it is a religious obligation for a pregnant person to seek an abortion. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So where is that? So when we talked on the phone, yeah. um, you had said something, and this was, again, we talked later in the evening, um, and I was literally changing the light bulb right there um, <laughs> when we were speaking, um, about the way that, so you had said the word evangelicals, and I don't know if you mean that in the Jewish sense or in the Christian sense, or maybe just in the religious sense, um, but you had said there's like a different view of scripture. And I asked that because the verses that you're quoting, like in Exodus and in some of the other stuff, are the same verses that that my old tribe is quoting, but for some reason we come to different um, different ramifications of 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 like of, of birth and, and abortion. So what do you mean in a different view of like scripture? Yeah. Judaism writ large is a conversation through time and through space about the ways we are supposed to live in this world and what it means to be a human being in this world and what it means to be in relationship with each other and with the universal, with the divine, with uh, the future, with the past. And so whenever we approach something in Judaism, it is through that lens. Jews don't tend to look at the Bible as literal revelation in the same way that Christians do. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of them as our core tribal narratives. And our I want to make sure when you say Bible, you mean the Jewish Bible or the Christian Bible. I want to make sure that we're using the word in the same way. Because like some of my friends that are Jewish, like they stop um, in, in where I would begin, like in Matthew and Mark. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I want to yeah. make sure that we're talking about the same Bible. So the what Jewish do you mean Bible, you the Hebrew Bible. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the, the real Bible without all your extra... <laughs> yeah, um, I like part two. I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that's the thing to understand is that broadly Judaism does have part two. The Talmud in many ways serves mm -hmm. as that part two for Judaism. It is the lens through which we understand everything else. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really different how Judaism works and, and how we relate to our texts. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a funny thing as a Jew that like we've got these tribal stories and this whole bunch of other people have decided that their their stories also mm -hmm. yeah uh, yeah that's fair yeah so when so okay so again a word talmud not a word that i engage with daily oh yeah you um, want me to take that apart for you what is that um i could so google they, it that's not fun um yeah yeah totally. and probably not a good exercise either because lord knows what i'll get the core story the core um the core myth, and I don't mean myth in a negative, I mean in an academic sense, right? Like the core story that tells us who we are as mm -hmm. Jews is that at the moment of revelation, when the Torah is given at Mount Sinai, uh, that there is an oral tradition that is passed to Moses as well. And that that tradition is passed from, you know, Moses to Joshua, to the elders, to so on and so forth, through time, mm -hmm. through to the rabbis. And then when we start getting into, you know, around the year of zero, around the year of Jesus, as you're dealing with Roman occupation, as you're dealing with the destruction of the temple, which is really not just the destruction of the temple, it's the destruction of Jewish society and civilization and war and famine and rape is a tool of war. I mean, it's, it's awfulness, uh, ethnic cleansings of areas. Uh, there's this fear that this tradition is gonna be lost. And so it's core stories are written down around the year 200. And then over the next 600 years after that, there are discussions and debates and um, arguments and philosophy that is placed upon that and edited. And in some ways is kind of like Wikipedia mm. in that it, it's generation after generation of people having conversations with each other. Uh, but for Judaism, it's very fair to say that we are the religion of the Talmud much more than the religion of the Bible in the same way that I would say that uh, for Christians, y'all are often the religion of uh, Christian scriptures rather than the religion of the Bible or the, the Hebrew Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we could argue there. I think most Christians in America are the religion of Paul. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was a new Testament major in college. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that we, we care a lot. Well, I take that back. 
I do. I don't know that we we care a lot about uh, the praxis of the rest of it and how it relates to the overarming, uh, overwhelming. The word that I like to use is shalom, which is is a word that I I just find is the best way to say what I mean about the relationship that people should have with one another. Um, but yeah, I think we like to lean in on Paul. I don't necessarily because it seems a bit whatever. That's not why you're here. So you so what is the notion so i know what the notion would be um for the average probably not the listener of this show but the average quote unquote christian in america um about what a fetus is and why life begins at conception what is a fetus for those of of your faith yeah so we've got core texts that say things like um first of all until the 40th day a fetus is considered like water like nothing uh and that, that's okay. sort of a legal standard uh, that at, at, so that would kind of be when you realize that you've missed your period. Uh, yes, the 40 days is probably they're not counting like people do today. So we're probably talking a few weeks after that. Right? Okay. okay. Um, but regardless, yeah, we're talking early, early days mm -hmm. uh, of a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, from that point on, a fetus is considered a potential life and has status as a potential life, but that life always has to come uh, uh the, the pregnant person's life always takes precedence over mm. the fetus in all situations um so we have all sorts of texts about this i don't know how deep you want to go as, as uh, deep as you want like great yeah. so let's uh i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and pull this up so i've got it in front of me too actually um let's see get all these texts so let's start with Exodus 21, 22. Mm -hmm. uh, so just pulling it up right now. Uh, I like Safaria, by the way, S-E-F-A-R-I-A dot org is definitely my favorite uh, uh, place to do Jewish learning. Um, so we're looking at this text right here. Uh, when two or more parties fire and one of them pushes a pregnant woman and a miscarriage results, but no other damage ensues. The one responsible shall be fined according to the woman's husband, uh, how that woman's husband may exact the payment to be based on reckoning. Um, okay, this is pretty straightforward, right? There's two people fighting. There's a pregnant woman who is standing there, presumably on the sides, gets knocked over and has a miscarriage as a result of that. So what is the punishment for Jewish law according to that? The answer is that there's going to be a fine. And interestingly enough, it's a kind of progressive taxation that's happening right here, right? Uh, the, the, the greater the uh, ability of the person to pay, the, the, the more they owe in that mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. But then we get this next line in verse 23. But if other damage ensues, meaning damage that is not the miscarriage, the penalty shall be life for a life, meaning if the pregnant person dies, the penalty is capital punishment. It's worth noting the rabbis totally get rid of capital punishment and uh, turn this into the financial. Anyways, that's a different different conversation. But right, if the pregnant person dies, it's a life for a life. If they lose an eye, it's an eye for an eye. If they lose a tooth, it's right. Um, and we see this clear distinction there between what the punishment is for the loss of a fetus, the loss of a pregnancy, mm -hmm. and what the punishment is for the loss of actually the pregnant person, the human being um, who is living and breathing and walking and talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is where Judaism really starts with this question. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that text before we keep going? Yeah, so yes, um, yes. So why 40 days? Regardless of the Gregorian calendar of days, I don't care about the, the length of the hours. It doesn't matter to me. But why 40? Like, what is, why? Or is it just arbitrary? So, you know, I don't know the answer to that. It comes, I believe, from the Tom, but I'm going to pull up my text sheet in a second. That wasn't in my thread, but I've got... Uh... <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. I've got all these uh, sitting in Google Docs, right? It's the beauty of the internet mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see where that comes from. So... Two different sections from the Talmud, the text we talked about, uh, somewhat related texts right here. One says that if one becomes pregnant until the 40th day, it is considered mere fluid. Mm -hmm. Part of that has to do with, you know, the distinguishing between miscarriages and uh, menstruation or irregular menstruation or right, there's all sorts of 
all sorts of things there. Mm -hmm. Um, This, I believe, also is a standard in Islam as well. Uh, But this becomes a legal standard for Judaism. It's not even considered a potential life that early. Uh, Similarly, though, there's another line also from the same text from the Talmud. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who's the big shot, holds a fetus is considered part of its mother's thigh, meaning it's a part of its mother's body until it is born. It is not seen as an independent being. Mm. It is seen as really something that is a part of the pregnant person. Yeah. So what is the, uh, the woman viewed as then also like, like, so, cause it feels as though the woman is treated as property in the same way that like you killed my horse. Now you, now you buy me another horse. Yeah. Well, certainly right. Like if we're talking about biblical versions of marriage, we're, we're dealing with uh, deep misogyny and deep sexism and, mm-hmm. uh, uh, a relationship where a woman is fundamentally uh, property, right? And yeah. That's not how Judaism operates today. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, that, that's that's the context for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the in the context of this Exodus verse as well. So this doesn't say that this is a spousal pregnancy. This is just any pregnancy, correct? Uh, yes. That's not a. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Those are my questions. So, but if you let me stop you every time, I will have many questions. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, where does that then go? So, where does that like where does that springboard? Yeah. So we have this whole setup, right? Of first of all, establishing that a uh, uh, fetus is a potential life is an entirely different category. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, and in fact, actually, here let me give you another quote from uh, uh, the Mishnah. This one's incredibly graphic. Uh, but the mission is often mission as a part of the Talmud okay. uh, it is often incredibly graphic because the rabbis are trying to understand and deal with the realities of life. And they're, they're talking about uh, what do you do if a uh, pregnancy is in crisis? What do you do if someone is trying is actively giving birth and there's crisis happening? Yeah. So like, like there's in danger to the mom. Like, there's clear yeah. and present danger, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and, just again, a, a warning that this is graphic language, that if a person was having trouble giving birth, they abort the fetus inside them. They must abort the fetus inside them, even up to and including taking it out limb by limb. And that is supposed to be graphic for these people too, right? To, to show you really what they're talking about. Because, this is a direct quote, existing life comes before potential life. And now this, the second half of this, I think you'll find interesting. If most of the child had come out already, they do not touch it because we do not push off one life for another. What do you mean push off? Um, yeah. It's like, like it's, choose. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Okay. This is just kind of Talmudic language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that actually this is the rabbinic equivalent. And remember, we're talking about about 1800 years ago for this text. Sure. Of what we think of as viability today, right? The point at which a fetus can survive outside of the womb. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. A baby could breathe on a baby could breathe on its own. And I'd assume there's still wiggle room there for yet yeah, we have medicine now. And so that that that's a shifting window because we also can fight cancer. We still lose, but we can, exactly. we can do a lot of things. Yeah. Exactly. But it's a broad value, right? We okay. can interpret this uh uh into Judaism. Uh it, it, and actually that that includes uh there's a theoretical conversation in that same text about the death penalty. Again, the rabbinic tradition gets rid of the death penalty, but still likes to imagine the boundaries of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a specific line that said, unless a pregnant person is in labor, actively in labor, you do not put off their execution for them to give birth, w- which is as clear of a sign as you can imagine Jewishly yeah. that the fetus is not considered an independent life, but just a part of the pregnant person uh, until uh, the birth. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So Potential life, that's not a word that I use in sentences usually. That's not even really the way I use the word potential. Can you rip that apart? Because I feel like that is a different way to talk about people yeah. than, than we normally do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the idiom of Judaism is legal conversations, how you should behave. And, it, and it, it works much like American case law without a Supreme Court. It's like we've got the the appeals courts and circuit courts without the Supreme Court. There's no ultimate body uh, deciding anything, but, but it is the language of law uh, uh, 
that we deal with. And I totally now have lost my train of thought. So bring me back to the question. <laughs> uh, so potential life. Like, potential life. Yeah. yeah. So, so when the rabbis are talking about potential life, they really mean this as legal categories. They're trying to understand in ethical categories, right? They're, they're trying to divide and understand their world. And they know that a fetus is not the same thing as a baby. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we know that a fetus is not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're trying to understand the distinction between these things. They're uh, basing it on what they understand to be both uh, Jewish textual precedent in, in what you call the Hebrew Bible, and also this oral tradition that's been passed to them and that they're trying to record down uh, in these documents. And so, uh, you know, we, in many ways, it's similar to, uh, I've been studying with my Talmud group I, I, on Zoom with my congregation, uh, the, the tractate dealing with blessings and prayer. And the first question they ask, because they're talking about a, a prayer you only say in the morning is, when is the morning? And they spend the next, you know, 200 pages, not talking about prayer, but talking about what is that boundary between when it is night, when it is morning, what is the in-between time when, in dividing that up, because that is what they do. And that's what they're trying to do here is make mm. a distinction between uh, potential life, life that may exist, potential human life, mm -hmm. uh, and actual human life, and trying to weigh the, the, the ethics that those sorts of distinctions create. Yeah. So moving beyond Exodus, what else does the Hebrew Bible, I'm going to use those words essentially because that's the words you used, um, have to say as it relates to the decision of Roe v. Wade? So the, that Exodus line that I gave you is the most significant line when it comes to abortion for Judaism mm -hmm. in the Hebrew Bible. And, it, and I guess what I'm saying and what I meant earlier when I said that Judaism views scripture differently is everything that I have referenced is scripture for Jews. Mm. That uh, the, these Talmudic references are at least as weighty as the Exodus reference. And, and um, you know, for instance, within, within the ultra Orthodox world, which is quite a yeah. sexist world at times, yeah. men study Talmud, women study Bible. Yeah. Can I ask a question about the Bible then? So big in, and so I, I believe that a lot of things can be the inspired word of God. Honestly, you could be the inspired word of God. Um, if you, if you're, his truth is, is truth. And, um, I mean, if, you're going to dig my monodies. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I should read him. Um, it, cause it, truth is truth. And if, and if it's truth, where else would it come from? And how is that not a word from God anyway? Uh, full of, full of the heresy today. Everybody can burn me. Um, I lost my train of thought now. It's okay. Cause I know where I want to go anyway. I just don't forget. I can't remember where I was going with that. Um, what do we do then with other texts? So for instance, one of the ones that is big in say a church on the street would be, you know, of course a fetus is a body because it says in Psalm 139 and I'm going to go from memory. I don't, I'm not a, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not the person, you know, so you knew me in my inmost being, uh, you knitted, you knew me, you know, when, when I was knitted together in my mother's womb. Um, which does kind of anthropomorphize the fetus. So how does your, how do you, how do you deal with so that? Yeah, the normative Jewish interpretation of that text is that it's talking about prophets and, and that is a specific reference to prophets. And that, that's the straightforward interpretive move there that Jews have long had on that text. Huh. Um, but more broadly than that, I would say that these other texts, and there's a Jeremiah text that a number of Christians like to reference also, mm -hmm. that that's just kind of not how Judaism works also, that it's not like, show me a different text from the Bible and it changes everything. Mm -hmm. We're this conversation through time and space, mm -hmm. and it's the conversation which has the value, not the original piece or one of the earlier pieces or... Yeah, uh, yeah. So I do remember a relevant question then, um, you, what you just said brought it back to it. So my question is that upon like inspiration, so like is the Tal Talmud and the other, and the other texts that, that your faith is using, are they still a thing that are being wrestled with? Or it, was it done like in, well, I'm just going to say 1771 because it feels good and, and that's where we stopped and now we just go with what they said. Like, yeah, 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 got it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so 1771 is like yesterday for Jewish time, first of all. But uh, <laughs> uh, Talmud ends about uh, the year 700 CE. This this side is zero. Okay, uh, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
there's a metaphor that I really like for, for Judaism of the pearl, right? A, a pearl is a grain of sand that enters into an oyster and has all of these layers that are built upon it. I think we can think of the Torah as that grain of sand. This is a classic Jewish image. But every generation of Jews is adding their layer, and it is all of those layers which create the value of a pearl. Mm. We would never cut open a pearl to get that, you know, chas shalom, God forbid, to get that grain of sand back. Mm. Um, and similarly, the value of Judaism is this broad conversation. Uh, it, it, and that's what I mean by we look at scripture differently. It's really a very different, it's almost a different genre that huh. we use. Yeah. yeah. So, so you say your things on the internet, right? And, and uh, people like me read them, and I'm sure not everybody is as kind. What is the reaction to people that are doing what you're doing that are like, yeah, about this decision? It's really cute that you Christians happen to think that you can legislate your faith and make that my law. Like, what is the reaction from everyone that's like, yes, it took us since the moral majority, but we did it. We finally got all the Supreme Court people we wanted. Um, we figured out how to like money empire and lobbyists and we did it. We did it together. Yay. We won. Um, hopefully the sarcasm is coming through there. Like yeah. what, like what has been the response as, cause I honestly, I've been like, I have really enjoyed reading it because I'm learning so very much um, that I did not expect to learn. And that makes me partially thankful for this decision because I would not have even bothered to learn things that I didn't know. And I, I say that, with the caveat of I am not thankful for the decision. I, I think it was the wrong decision, but I'm thankful that it's caused me to learn. And I can I can make those two be separate things, at least in my thankful mind. Thankful for the learning. Yeah. There yeah. You go. At least in my mind I can. Um so what has been that response? Like how has that been? Yeah. I, American Jews are scared. We look out and it feels like more and more in the United States, it is a white Christian minority, not that white Christians are necessarily a minority, but, but it, might, it is a distinct group of these people that have taken the levers of power and first of all, corrupted the system. I think democracy is over in America generationally. I think it's it's been lost. Um, but more and more, it feels like they are instituting a version of white Christian nationalism on the rest of us and in enforcing it on the rest of us in all sorts of broad and scary ways. Um, you know, I, I have a trans kid. Mm -hmm. which is a relatively non-controversial thing in the Jewish world. Mm. Um, a different conversation sometime, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So think back on our conversation on the phone, that Easter response from that gentleman that I'm a big fan of, like that's yeah. one of those where I'm like, wait, what? Um, but not while you're here. Yeah. Different conversation. Yeah. Yeah. But I have to go and defend my kid and his basic humanity before my legislature, because I live in a red supermajority state and I go down there and the white Christian nationalism seeps from the walls. Mm. And my wife and I are up at night having the conversations of when do we flee and what is too much and right like in places like Texas and Alabama, they're sending government goons to the doors of loving affirming parents of trans kids. Mm. and threatening to take their kids away and charge these parents with child abuse. And we're having the same kind of conversations at night that Jews had in the 1930s in Europe, in the early thirties. Mm. Yeah. And like, I'm a rabbi. I don't say that lightly. That's not, that's not something that we toss around in the Jewish community. The Holocaust is sacred and holy and untouchable. And yeah. so for me to say that in for, broadly the rest of the Jewish community to look out and say, yeah, that's what it feels like. I, that's what a lot of Jews are feeling right now. It feels like we are losing our place in America, that mm. America is becoming a white Christian nationalist country. Mm. Um, it feels like the federal government has been lost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 I would agree. I, um, I do not like Christian nationalism. Um, I, uh, I lead the worship and I help lead the worship in my church. And they had asked me if I could play um, God Bless America. 
and sing it to which I was like, I will, I will play those notes to placate the people, but I'm not singing that because to be quite honest, I do not feel one like that matters at the moment. I'm quite upset with America and two, that has no place in a religious worship place. Like that's the national, right? why, why am I here? Like I'm not here to sing to America. Um, and so I won't. Um, Written by a Jew, by the way. God bless America. Was it really? Yeah. Huh. Um, which I think actually speaks to how much America has been, Jews called it in Yiddish, the golden of Medina, the like the promised land, the golden land. The mm. uh, uh, It has been that for us because it was this place where we didn't have to choose between our Jewishness and our Americanness. In Europe, mm -hmm. we had to choose, right? Mm -hmm. um, actually, in Europe, we didn't get much of a choice. But uh, here, that wasn't true mm -hmm. and that is changing and it's clear that it's changing and right uh, it's clear that this supreme court will not find jewish religious liberty to exist to the same degree that it finds white conservative christian religious liberty to exist yeah so i want to pivot from there so you did send me an article i have not read it but i heard about it on i use spotify and it does like the daily drive I don't yeah. know if you, it's one of my favorite things because the news clips are like eight minutes long. I'm like, I yeah. can do that. I can do this in the car for eight minutes. You talk longer than that. And I'm a little bit angry. Give me back my music. But, um, it's a funny guess, thing for a guy who runs a podcast to say, by the way. So I don't listen to a lot of music. Uh, I pretty much listen to absolutely nothing. Um, because you get it with the kids. Like I, every once in a while, I just want to be left alone. Like totally, I just, totally. I love the noise. I love the music. I just, I just yeah. don't. I just want to roll the window down. Like today, I actually went the long way to the branch that I went to because I drove next to a river and I slowed down. And so I literally drove for 10 extra minutes next to the Thai River and I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, nice. I went out of my way and I'm not going to expense those extra mileage if you're, if you're listening. I'm not doing that. That's on me. And I enjoyed it. Um, so, but the news is important because there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of things, um, a lot of things going on everywhere. Yeah. Um, everywhere. But I just, yeah, I don't, it makes me laugh. Yeah, I, the podcast, I don't listen to a lot of music, um, really ever. Um, and I have no idea where I was going with it. Oh, yes, but, sorry, I got you off. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Um, so what, oh, I do know. So the court, there's a, there was a, on the news, it was a, um, there's a, I guess, a lawsuit for, uh, that appears to be coming from, from the Jewish religious body Jewish community in Florida. Yeah. I, I'm not sure this is the lawsuit. It, mm -hmm. It's a congregation in Florida that is suing, uh, for violation of religious liberty. I, I read the actual complaint and, mm -hmm. uh, let's just say it's wide ranging. Mm -hmm. Uh, but regardless of the merits of this particular lawsuit, there are certainly going to be lawsuits flooding the courts, making a religious liberty argument from a Jewish perspective, because right. It, it, whatever you think of my textual interpretation, it is thousands of years of Jewish textual interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jews have viewed it this way for thousands of years. Yeah. And so, right, like these states that have these, they're called RIFRAs, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, mm -hmm. uh, which were expansions of First Amendment religious guarantees. But states that have them and that were put in place, truthfully, to reinforce a certain type of white Christian mm -hmm. We're going to play in the schools and you're going to like it. Absolutely. Freedom to impose, right? Yeah. Uh, we're going to find out if, if these states really believe in religious liberty and religious freedom or if they just believe in white Christian religious liberty and freedom because Jews are going to sue everywhere and we're going to have real good standing to sue everywhere. And yeah. I think we're going to see Jewish organizations that are going to open up or try to open up um, locations to give out uh, pharmaceutical abortificants mm -hmm. uh, and plan B in states where it is illegal. And, you know, this is a religious obligation. Yeah. Yeah. So realistically, what do you like just you um, expect of that? So let's say it's because, you know, it's going to take four or five years that happens. Somebody somebody sues, it goes to appeals, blah, blah, blah. Realistically, do you see this Supreme Court going? Yeah, we screwed up. But also you don't get to have your freedom of what you believe. And, and we, we get where you're coming from. But um, nope. Like, do you see it like actually changing? Uh, especially because I can see like the yeah. Muslim faith also coming alongside. And, yeah, oh, and, sure. and to be quite frank, there are many Christians that also would agree with you. I'm one yeah, of them. Absolutely. I, though I want to say I am personally pro-life. Um, but 
I can remember when my wife was giving birth to my son, they literally threw me away. Like they threw me out of the, because there were issues and I won't go into those issues on a public yeah. podcast. If you had asked me right then, I didn't know my son and I love my wife, pick my wife. I would have said it in a heartbeat and, and he may listen to this and buddy, don't hear me saying that that's anything bad. I just know what I would have said. And so I say I'm pro-life right now. Um, but I've always also been anyone else's ability to be whatever they are. Um, but I know I what I call I that pro-life and Judaism would call, call that pro-life because you're valuing life yeah. or potential life. Yeah. Well, no, I, if you had asked me, so for instance, I say that, so we did our screening, like they give you the screening. Um, and really those screenings were, were more for like, do you want to screen for, you know, down syndrome, all that stuff. And we literally said, we're not even ever going to consider an abortion. So it doesn't matter what that answer is just we, we because it, it was a thing that I, and I still would never like that. that that's me. Um, that being said, I know what I would have said, um, because I was ready and prepared to say, it, and it is a vivid memory. And those two don't stand together. Um, and so when you think about people, maybe like myself, um, other Christians, people of, of Islamic faith, and, and I'm sure there are other faiths as well that I'm also equally ignorant of that also would agree. If all of them come together realistically and say, yeah, there are many religions, even in America, we all disagree. Is that going to change in seven, eight, ten years or whatever when the next one comes to the Supreme Court? I think democracy has been lost in America. I think there has been a coup that has happened that happened in slow motion. And I think it is generationally lost. Mm. Like we, we have five white conservative Christian Supreme Court justices who were appointed by white conservative Christian presidents who lost the popular vote, but got to be president because they won the white conservative Christian vote. Mm -hmm. And then three of those justices were appointed by senates that were controlled by Republicans that represented less than half of Americans. They say that by 2040, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states, which means that 30% of Americans, whiter, more Christian, older, more conservative, more evangelical, We'll have way more power. 70 Senate seats, huh. right? We, we've had 40% almost of the presidencies in my adult life go to the loser of the mm -hmm. six of the Supreme Court, right? Like it's been lost. It has been corrupted. And I think we need to regroup and figure out what comes next. But I, I no. So no is the answer. I do not believe that mm. the Supreme Court is a legitimate court of justice. Um, I don't believe it fulfills actually the, the Jewish biblical mandate that, that societies have courts of justice. Yeah. So what do we do then? What do you do? I do four years. I mean, my, my daughter is above and I don't want her to be pregnant right now, but you know, it's a thing. Like, what do we do? Like 10 years down the road, what do I do? What do you do about abortion? What do you do yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of things about what do I do about, but specifically as it relates to Roe v. Wade, like what do I do? Do I just say, yeah, we're doing this anyway. Come and get me if you want to come get me. Like, what do I do? But look, the reality has always been the people of means and people in the majority population have access to abortions and mm. that's not going to change, uh, right? This is going to hurt people who are poor. Mm -hmm. This is going to hurt people who are black. This is going to hurt people who are brown. This is going to hurt people who uh can't take off work and work hourly jobs this is right like these are the people who it's gonna hurt uh people who have means it'll always be easy and has always been easy mm -hmm. even if it's gonna be a little harder now even if it's a little extra trip and a little extra schlep and even if it means going to canada in the future or whatever it looks like let me restate my question i don't mean what do i do if my daughter gets pregnant i mean what do i do to actually affect change to help people yeah look i I think it's time for us to have bigger conversations about means and tactic, tactics and strategies. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's time, like I'm, I'm hopefully gonna be planning a conference or, or helping to, to plan a conference in Germany with German anti-fascist educators, because I think that's what we're facing in the United States is fascism. Mm. And I think we need to understand how to take it on and what tactics work and what strategies work and what tactics don't 
right? Like uh, in all sorts of broad ways, but but there are Germans who very much know what this looks like. Mm. Um, and I want to hold on to the fact that we're sitting in 2022 talking about needing Americans to go to Germany to be trained in how to push back against American fascism. But that's that's a crazy yeah. extreme point that we have arrived at in our moment. Yeah. So I want to ask two questions to close, just because I want to be respectful of your time and you may need to check on the kids or or the wife or they've been happening. remarkably quiet actually they're all <laughs> they're all camping we talked about this before we went on but they're all camping out in the basement in a uh, yeah a yeah so people listen to this and they're like yeah like like seth i have no idea yeah. what this is um you would reference something called safaria and i think you said s-a-f-a-r-i-a.org maybe that's yeah. not what you said um where do people go like what's the first place they go to to begin to educate themselves to go huh okay um, because I think that that education does better inform, especially listeners of this show um, that are predominantly either, I don't know, I don't know, actually, I don't actually know who they are. I, I think I know who they are. I know who I am, that that go to a church um, and like it or not, that church has power. And um, if you're listening to this, you happen to be in a, a fairly wealthy country. Um, it just is what it is because you have internet and you can download podcasts. And so it's new information. Where's the first place to begin to dip that toe into um, and then possibly a support place to go. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable now. I need to talk about this. Like, where would you direct people to? Yeah, I, I want to take that. I want to take that anger, especially anger like I have, and, and direct it somewhere. Like, do something with it instead of just watching it simmer into nothing. Yeah, and invent on social media and all of those things. Well, you know, social media is just it, it fixes everything. That's that's the <laughs> only way to get anything done. Um, exactly. <laughs> You know, I would say it's really easy to read a lot of Jewish sources on the internet if you Google. And the the core piece of information that I think you got to understand as a Christian entering into these spaces is that the Orthodox are a tiny minority of Jews. They are not the normative Jewish experience. They are the exception. Mm -hmm. uh, they're only about nine percent of American Jews. I'm a member of the the largest movement, the Reform movement, which is about forty percent. Um, I used to be a part of the conservative movement, which is about 20% and is not conservative in mm. any way that you would recognize, kind of like the Episcopal church okay. uh, is today is, is really what mm. I'd compare them to. High okay. church, high ritual, yeah. um, but women and queer rabbis and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and so pay attention to those sources and pay attention and make sure that you're not reading uh only or exclusively orthodox sources or when you are reading them that you understand that you are reading fringe sources or or at least small yeah. minority sources within the jewish community yeah um, so at a high level what do you mean by orthodox reformed conservative like very very brief like yeah 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 um so uh reform by the way just with an m no ed okay m. okay uh, th there are three major movements denominations uh whatever word you use uh of american judaism today uh, reform conservative and orthodox reform is the largest as i said a moment ago about 40 percent um it is going to the difference between reform and conservative tends to be what you might think of as high church and rock church okay. uh, the reform yeah. is not rock yeah. it's yeah. not yeah so hillsong versus lutheran for for does that work yeah though it's probably Sit in there, to be like... still don't move do not raise your hand ever sit there and sit there and listen versus oh it's u2 it's a u2 cover band and then we talk about the bible for 20 minutes or the jewish so the answer is no to any of those specifics and yes to the general vibe that you're talking about yes got it got uh it. yeah so that's what you tend to have there and <laughs> yeah. you know okay. people choose based on how much they like ritual and things like that but, yeah yeah uh, and then the orthodox world are the fundamentalists of the jewish world and so you mean fundamentalists in the same way that i would like I think so. These are the people who are um, generally quite conservative. Um, Politically, uh, I wasn't talking politics there. Okay, um, that's a that's sort of a different thing. Okay, um, but no, in terms of their outlook on the world, in terms of their views, often on uh, it's a very nuanced and broad community sure. itself with uh, lots of amazing sure. people and diversity and yeah. But, but among those three all three would basically agree about um, the view of a fetus is a thing until, until it's a baby. Like these are two separate things. All would agree that those are different things mm -hmm. and that potential life 
that, that existing life always takes precedence over potential life, that there would be enormous differences between many reform rabbis and many orthodox rabbis on the specifics of acceptable reasons for an abortion within that frame, but everyone sure. would have needed blanket bans on okay. abortion or a violation of Jewish okay. religious liberty. Okay. I should have probably asked that 20 minutes ago, but didn't. You just snip it into the beginning. We'll no, pretend like it I was. am not. I could, I could edit that. I once edited out a crying baby and I don't believe that anybody still can tell me what episode that baby was in. I've edited out many things. Um, I'm not going to fix that. <laughs> so one other theology based question though. So why breath? Is that like a callback to Genesis and like people are people once the breath of life is breathed in or is it something else? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. That that's, okay. that is life. For, okay. for Judaism in, in, in a profound sense that, um, in fact, the, the word for breath and the word for soul are basically the same word. Yeah, I'm going to say it wrong. And hopefully I'm not, if I'm wrong, I'm going to edit this out because I don't want to be in it. So that's Ruach, right? Correct? Uh, no, it's a different one that is very similar also. Okay. Neshama, it, we've got all these words, Neshama, Nefesh, Ruach, that are, mm. are slightly synonymous. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So... When you, so here's the nice existential question. So now we get yeah, to it late was, at night. For it. So when you try to wrap words around whatever God is, the divine is, whatever that is, what is that? Yeah. Um, can I give you two different answers? All the answers you want. Um, the first answer is that for me, God is what we mean by the capital T truth of the universe, the underlying truth. I mean, like E equals MC squared kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but we can never know capital T truth. We can never hold it. We can never see it. That there is fundamentally nothing that we can say about the divine. That, that in fact, anything that we say about the divine, anything, God is loving, God is vengeful, God is, is, us projecting ourselves onto God. It's, it's us creating God in humanity's image rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, so Hasidic rabbi, the Kutzker of you calls it a, a idolatry of the mind. I like that phrase. Um, it, and so all that we can say is God is not loving. God is not vengeful. God is not kind in the same way that God is not 15 pounds overweight. These are human qualities and we are taking sort of our image of what we think is the best human quality and applying it to the divine. And so since we can know nothing about the creator, nothing definitionally, uh, then the best way to understand is creation. Mm. And that means science and the act of understanding the universe is why we're here and is the goal of the divine. And Einstein sitting alone in his room coming up with relativity was prophecy in the same way that Moses was and mm. the same way that Maimonides thought of it. And, um, and, and that was sacred and is sacred. And that's not a challenge to God. That, that, that is an expansion of the divine in this world when we know that. Mm. Um, mm. Is that both? That's my first. Okay. And that's Maimonides. I'm gonna. I, I I got a book for you on Maimonides. I'm actually. I wrote it down. Ask about what to read because that's yeah. not. Um, yeah, I I tend to navigate towards um, some of the Eastern fathers when I like when I read about like you know like Christian texts. Like I always seem to lean more toward. Like I'll say something, and people are like, "Oh, that's Athanasius," and I'm like, "That's a who what?" And so I'll, I'll read it, and I'm like, "Oh, okay. I think yeah. Why was he a heretic again? Oh, I see. I see, y'all." You yeah. wanted money. Yeah. You wanted money and you wanted to take that land. I got it. I understand now. I misunderstood before, but now I understand that it's still the same story. Got it. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to it. What's the second one? So the second one is uh, comes from a rabbi, Reb, Reb Zalman Shachter Shlomi of a blessed memory. Uh, it says, when you look out at a field of grass, this comes from the Zohar, the ancient Jewish mystical text. It, it says that, Every blade of grass, every living thing, but, but even every blade of grass has an angel that is whispering to it, grow, grow. And it doesn't mean this literally, right? This is a, this is a mystic 
mystic understanding that says that there are these frames of existence, that the angelic frame and the grass frame that we see are, are both existing on top of each other and are both true and are both, right? They, they are the same thing at some level. Um, and so Reb Zalman says, you look out at this field of grass and it too has an angel whispering to it, grow, grow. And so that, that field is made up of the pieces of grass, but it's still somehow different than the sum of its parts. Not greater, mm. just different, right? You can go and pull out a bunch of the grass, you can mow it or you can do whatever you want. And it is still that field. Um, we, we won't invite our Buddhist friends to this conversation. They would uh, disagree with that. But, um, similarly, Reb Zalman says, every human being has an angel whispering to it, grow, grow. And when you back away, every, every group of people, the Jewish people, the Christian people, the Americans, the, 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 every group of people, every, every tribe that we create is an angel whispering to us, grow, grow. And when you back far enough away, so that you're talking about the totality of creation and the totality of life. And please God, I hope we're not just talking about this one little planet, this one little gray mm. blue dot in the corner, right? Mm. We're talking about the totality of life. That's the angel that we mean when we say God, right? I don't mean angel here, right? Uh, that's the essence that, that God is somehow the totality of life, but different than the sum of its parts. Mm. Um, but neither of these images of God to me are a God that changes or moves or affects or that I can pray to and will intervene. Or um, I think those are actually small gods. I think those mm. are really small gods. I think religion often creates really small gods. Yeah, that's because people create religion. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have a good friend. I, I like both of those answers, by the way. Um, these Those are my favorite questions. So I ask that question of everyone. Um, I'm and glad I didn't listen to the beginning or the end then yeah. before. Yeah, uh, I didn't at one time. And then I forget what it was. I asked that question randomly to somebody and then he asked me and I realized how hard it was to answer. And I was like, well, that's a question worth answering. Like if you, if you don't have to think about your response, it's not a question worth asking. Yeah. Um, and so I started, and then after that, um, I begin mixing them. So I'll take that part and I'll rip it out and I randomly assign them numbers and I let my kids pick the numbers. And then at the end of the year, um, I throw all of those answers together. And what's amazing is, and I'll put some music in there, you know, cause we need some Hans yeah. Zimmer kind of strings That's to cool. pull it. Yeah. What's amazing is it almost always tells a narrative totally at random and it is freaking amazing and it's so powerful. And the nice thing is I'm late. not, and the th yeah, yeah. nice thing is I'm not in it, but I'll ask that question of six and Muslims and atheists and it doesn't matter what the answer is, but it yeah. always ends up being something entirely entirely holy and and i just i just love it love it um yeah anyway so thanks for answering it um and thanks for being here tonight i really appreciated it yeah screw me on this was a treat yeah excellent um any plugs that you want to plug because that's what we do on podcasts you don't have to you can if you want doesn't matter i uh, plugs to plug no i don't have any big plugs i'm, I'm perfect plug free right now go and, uh, <laughs> plug free <laughs> yeah <laughs> I can do plug free. Well, good. Rabbi, thank you for being on the show very much. For having me on. This is fun. Yep. yep. All right. I will stop the recording.